Okay, folks, uh, their minute is up and we're diving right on in. Uh, welcome to our webinar today. The topic is testing for quality, piloting best management practices across Massachusetts. Again, my name is Jason Hale. I'll be your friendly moderator today from National Nonprofit, the Recycling Partnership. Uh, first, just a couple of quick housekeeping items. Uh, you've probably already sorted this out, but for audio, you can either listen through your computer or your phone line. And the GoToWebinar uh, uh, control panel gives you the option for either on the audio tab. So choose wisely and uh, switch up if you'd like. And also, in terms of questions, um, you noted that your line is muted and that that was on purpose. Uh, but you can use um, the question feature on that uh, GoToWebinar control panel. Just type one in. We'll be taking them as we go. Uh, we do have a lot of content, but if you've got a burning question, uh, don't hold it back, and we'll do everything we can to answer it. We love some questions. So I think just one more little, little housekeeping piece. Uh, the Recycling Partnership is subject to various antitrust rules. Uh, in short, this means that if you're a Recycling Partnership member, uh, just during this call, don't discuss the ways in which you compete in the marketplace. And there's a whole lot of examples listed on the slide. And if a lawyer ever asks you, we cover this thoroughly. And let's move on to real stuff. Um, so we've got five fantastic webinar speakers lined up for you today to talk about quality. Um, you can see their pictures. And I'd love them to introduce themselves, starting with, uh, starting with Rob Colson. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. My name's Rob Colson. I'm the DPW Director with the Town of West Springfield, and uh, thanks for coming out today and listening. Excellent. Moving along to Arlene. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Arlene Miller. I'm the uh, Municipal Assistance Coordinator for Mass DEP for Western Mass and West Springfield, which is featured in this webinar, is one of the towns I have the privilege of working with. Right on, Arlene. And uh, Patrick? Yeah, I'm Patrick Mellow. I'm from Republic Services. Um, West Springfield happens to be one of the contract towns that Republic Services services. And we're part of a program put on by the Recycling Partnership, and hence this webinar. All right. Uh, Gunther, how about you? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Gunther Wellenstein with the City of Lowell, Solid Waste and Recycling Manager. Uh, we are a fourth largest city in the state, managing 25,000 curbside customers with uh, single stream recycling. Perfect. And uh, Mr. Marshall. Yeah, hi. This is Cody Marshall, and I'm uh, with the Recycling Partnership. <clears throat> and that they put my picture with uh, a hood on it so you can't see my face very well. So they do that on purpose. It's a wise move, I promise you all. Um, did I miss anybody? All right. We have five pictures, five speakers. And again, I'm Jason Hale. I'll just be your moderator uh, this afternoon. So uh, jumping right in first, what is the Recycling Partnership doing in Massachusetts? Cody, could you hum a few bars about that? Absolutely. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, as I said before, I'm Cody Marshall with the Recycling Partnership, and if you had heard our, if you checked in with us in our webinar a couple months ago, or if you heard Jason speak at the Massachusetts Recycling Conference, um, you know that we got a, a grant from MassDEP to conduct this work, and really it's, it's work that where we're, um, we're implementing some strategy and, and measuring the results uh, to try to improve quality of recyc curbside recycling um, and drop-off recycling throughout the Commonwealth. And um, I'm hoping there's a theme throughout this webinar that that kind of shows how important this partnership is and how great this partnership has been. MassDEP and the MACs that are involved have been fantastic. The four communities we're working with are fantastic. We're working with the MRFs and a couple haulers. And so really to um, um, to do a to do a project right, you got to have good partners, and and this is a great example of it. And I'm I'm really excited about the work. All right, perfect, perfect stuff, Cody. Appreciate that uh that intro. And uh, in short, in short, really, what we're doing is what pretty well every recycling program across the country is trying to do right now. They're trying to improve their quality, and and you always want more participation. You can always get more people participating. The focus is absolutely quality. But if you're going to improve your program, you might as well look at both. So that's what we're focusing on um, for sure. And so when we started really looking at this, it seems smart to start with what you know. 
And fortunately, collectively, as recycling professionals, we know a lot. Uh, there's been a lot of work done, a lot of best practices have developed, and the state of Massachusetts has done an incredible amount of research. Waste management has shared a lot of research. Uh, our little group, the Recycling Partners, and formerly Curbside Value Partnership, has done a ton of research. And again, communities, um, communities across the country have uh, celebrated great successes and learned from them, and we've learned from that. So we looked at some of the some of the learnings around the industry um, uh, and tried to apply them. And here were some things that struck us to be particularly relevant. Um, first, we can't only educate. Uh, the, the awareness and knowledge alone do not change behavior. And if you want any proof, just look at the amount of pizza I eat. I know pizza is really bad for me. I eat a ton of it anyway because I really like pizza, and awareness alone isn't going to stop me from eating pizza. Um, your residents are the same way about recycling and how they recycle and what they recycle. Uh, another thing, most people think they're recycling correctly. A lot of them aren't. We all know this. That's why we're in a little bit of a pickle because people are um, putting incorrect things into our recycling containers. But if you ask them, even if they're actually putting those items in their container, they, they're nine times out of ten thinking they're doing the right thing. And that's uh, that's surely something that the Massachusetts Research Massachusetts study has uh, has underlined. Um, a third thing is, there it is, um, teaching the children. Teaching the children is uh, super important, um, but it doesn't change recycling behavior in the home alone. So basically, this was something else that was uh, underlined by the Massachusetts uh, survey, that children don't necessarily influence behavior of the primary recyclers in any given household. So while teaching children is important for building that next generation of recycler, uh, if we want to improve quality right now, we've got to reach past the schools, we've got to reach past the kids, and go to kind of more overarching pieces of the population. Uh, a few more here. You can probably count. There are six. Um, enforcement without education is frustrating and disenfranchising. So what do I mean by that? I mean, if you came home and you had a ticket on your recycling cart, um, or, or somebody kind of came down on you about what you were putting in your, in your recycling, but you would never made an effort to tell them the correct things to do, they'd be pretty ticked, and they'd, you know, rightfully so. So make sure that you're not just going toward enforcement without having that other, that other more positive part. Um, confusion. Holy moly, people are confused. They're confused about plastics, and that's that. a lot of that uh, came through the Massachusetts work. A lot of it's come through in all the other studies. Uh, they're confused around all the evolving packaging and what, what to do with the, the new stuff they're buying. And they're confused about the rules of um, what and how to recycle, caps on or caps off, and wait, is the pizza box okay, and how much do I rent something? Um, it's just enough to drive you batty if you, if you don't follow it as closely as we all do. Um, so we have to get it simplified. And then last up, we've got to outweigh the barriers with ease and convenience and relevance. We've got to make it easy enough to do that it seems worthwhile to the people we're targeting. So that's all great. Um, what are we doing with that? Well. We're doing six things with that. Uh, one, we're mixing education and operations, and we'll talk more about that later, and also uh, throwing in some behavioral triggers. And the idea is if you have just finished consuming something and you're, you've got a choice to recycle it or to throw it away, wherever you are at that point, if we can have a recycling reminder or trigger to get people to put it in the right spot, that's ideal. We think a lot about places like the kitchen because a lot of recycling is generated there. So that... Um, this is a common theme, positive messaging and simple instructions. Positive, positive, positive. Whenever you're positive over a long lifespan of any program, that's actually really going to help your behavior um, long term. If you have a very specific problematic thing like uh, contaminants, um, you can take a negative message to that, but only in the short term. So basically long-term behavior isn't really influenced um, with the negative messaging. It's a turnoff. Um, and this, uh, this one, build awareness, understanding, and trigger behavior. And I've said that word a little bit before, I'm, and I, I, you see the three, two, one listed there. I'm going to babble about that in a minute, so I think we can just sort of bounce on. Um, okay, uh, we talked uh, a little bit this, uh, but um, negative alone at the curb or, or, or tickets is bad. Um, so coupling awareness messaging with very specific resident feedback at the curve. And I'm going to pause there for just a second um, and point out the kind of incredible opportunity that we all have, particularly curbside communities, 
wow, what an opportunity. You've got a truck that every week or two goes by every single household that you service. And there's an opportunity for an interaction, leaving up an oops tag or a thank you tag, something about how people are doing. And it's totally doable, and it's something that's, that's a very nice one-on-one -on -one conversation that's very simple to do. Or if you're on a drop-off center, if you have attendants there, they can do the same thing. Um, uh, next up, create a common list of materials. And just picture this for a minute. Uh, let's say I work in one town, and I live in another town, and I play softball league in a third town. And each one of those towns takes their materials to, a diff or to the same MRF. But each one of those towns talks very differently about what materials they accept. It happens everywhere across the country. So let's just cut through that, and let's simplify the material list to the greatest extent possible so that people aren't confused. And last up, positive. Just have a good looking, positive uh, campaign uh, all the time that is overarching across everything you do, and it's, it's going to go really well for you. So you're like, great, those are great principles. What's it all look like? So this is, this is what we're developing. Um, you can see that it's energetic, uh, it's got some bright colors, it's got some very positive messaging around it's all you and shine on, it's got people doing lifestyle things and looking pretty happy about it. Um, and also in our pilot communities, we worked really hard with, uh, with some MRFs, and Cody will talk about this later, but to hone in on what specific materials we want and don't want and trying to figure out how to present those as simply as possible and then create templates around all that and direction about what to show when and where and how. Um, and how to work at the curve and how to work elsewhere. So that's all that we built from this. And, and last up, before I ramble too, too long, uh, I talked about 321, and that's the key to this whole thing. So three is basically direct interaction with people, targeted engagement at the curve with oops and thank you tags, mailing them stuff for their kitchens like magnets and information cards, and going after uh, very specific problematic materials or new materials uh, by targeting, targeting them with a single campaign. As you see there, do not bag recyclables. Uh, that is a problem, right? People putting bag, bagged recyclables in the recycling cart. Um, number two is kind of taking a step back and just sort of general awareness. And think about general advertising as you know it. So maybe in your community you like billboards or social media or banners. Whatever that is, um, every community is going to be different and whatever fits for your residents and your budget. Um, is what we support and, and is a best practice in doing two of those things, any two, really, just to keep recycling top of mind. And then last up, the one. Uh, and basically that's going to be your standing resource, your go-to place when somebody has a very specific question. doesn't happen often for any individual, but when they do, they're probably going to your website. So making sure your website is really straightforward, answers the critical questions, and does so in a way that reinforces all the other stuff you have out there. That's basically the program, um, and we're piloting it uh, across Massachusetts. Cody, why don't you talk about the timeline? Yeah, definitely. And if you were on the last webinar, um, you kind of saw the, the idea behind the timeline. So beginning of this year, we did all the planning. And uh, you'll see now we're in May. We're in the middle of this um, measuring and testing period of the pilot. Um, we're working in the cities. and. Um, um, going out there every other week to the to curbside uh, the, or the residents on curbside, uh, tipping lids, checking the stuff, and we'll get into that. And then um, in the fall time frame, we'll check back in and um, and share results, um, and then uh, build resources that mass to provide to Mass DP that can then provide to communities around the Commonwealth. Okay, good deal. I know we'll talk more about those resources, but that's basically the tight time frame that we're working in, so you'll see a lot of results soon. Um, and Cody, why don't you just talk for a quick second about where we're piloting? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, to, today you're going to hear about the um, two projects that have already kicked off. That's in Lowell and West Springfield. Um, they're curbside programs that uh, every other week, um, single stream in carts, and then starting this month, we're going to be kicking off in Holden, where we're only going to be running uh, some education materials, not the curbside strategy. And we have been working with Needham that will kick off this month, um, which is our drop-off facility for the pilot. Excellent. All right. And miraculously, um, we are exactly on time for where we wanted to be on uh, when we hit the meat of the matter. Um, and instead of having to listen to me so much, uh, we're going to get into our panel. So 
let's uh, let's jump on into that with our first question, and, and it's simply, if we're running the pilot, what was the situation before these pilots started? Um, and so specifically in um, West Springfield and Lowell, what were they what were they looking at in terms of uh, quality um, prior prior to prior to this pilot starting? So I'd like to throw that out first to Gunther from Lowell. Yeah, good afternoon again, everybody. Um, in Lowell, last summer, we received a nasty gram from Waste Management's local MRF that they were receiving too much contamination, and we discussed it with uh, our hauler, which is also Waste Management, and the MRF operator trying to do a plan of attack, and uh, our first plan was to apply to Mass DEP for a grant that is uh, in parallel to the Recycling Partnerships grant, and uh, with their assistance, uh, we're going to knock uh, contamination out of our single stream. Good man. Good man, Gunther. Um, and uh, moving over to West Springfield, how about you, Rob? Uh, hi, Rob Coulson, West Springfield. Uh, West Springfield... In West Springfield, uh, we transferred uh, our curbside service that we had always had with a standard uh, put as much trash out as you want and some the blue uh, bin for to put your paper and your cans in. And we switched over April 2013 to single stream 96 gallon carts and 64 gallon trash carts with a $1.50 bag tag uh, for overflow uh, that you could attach to a 30-gallon bag. So since uh, April of 2013, when we switched over to this automated system with Republic Services, uh, since then, in up like most recently over the last year, waste management at the MRF had noticed uh, a little bit of a rec recycling contamination issue and was letting us know about it. And we've been working on it uh, through various uh, enforcement programs, looking in the carts, and trying to let people know when they are in violation. So that's where we started. That's when uh, the Recycling Partnership and MassDEP uh, stepped in with this pilot program to help us out. And we, uh, our challenge was, I think, with the single stream recycling is that people think they can recycle just about any item because it's a single stream cart. And I think a lot of it, uh, there's some confusion with that portion of it. All right, and good. Uh, good. <laughs> nope, that's good stuff, Rob. Um, and Patrick, anything to add in terms of what you were seeing um, out on the out on the routes as Republic Services uh, before the pilot? Well, as a as the hauler for the town, one of our responsibilities is. You know, the drivers only see it when it actually comes out of the container into the bucket because we use uh, Corrado cans, front end load, fully automated recycling truck. And so our responsibility was to, you know, if the driver notices, you know, uh, an awful lot of that contamination, then we, we start to try and track the areas it is and report it to the town to rob so that you know they're informed as to what's going on and we can come up with a plan to try and fix it. Okay, fair point. I like it. So let's, uh, and, and Rob already kind of hit on this a little bit, but um, let's talk about kind of your actions to date in terms of what you've been doing specifically to tackle contamination. Um, and Patrick, why don't you just keep the mic for a minute and talk about what, what your crew has been doing to, uh, to help with that issue already before we started the pilot. Our crew has, um, with all our contract towns, we have these sorry tags. Um, and the driver, when he notices these, he has boxes to check off. And he'll check off the box and stick it on the container, letting the resident know, you know what they were doing wrong. And we've printed out um, the papers off of the MERS website and try and stick those on the containers as well to help educate as best we can. Um, to help the town out with this problem. Good, good, good stuff. And uh, good stuff, Patrick. And Rob, uh, anything to add from what you said before about what kind of what you guys were up to to tackle contamination pre-pilot? Yeah, pre-pilot, um, Patrick, so the Re Republic Service, uh, they provide us with some tags, uh, same tags, the uh, sorry tags, 
and we would uh, tag the barrel and mark off the issue. Uh, in addition, uh, we've been using an app with a tablet, a collector app, and our GIS department is a, a huge uh, part of that. They've uh, enabled us to uh, be able to record the address and the issue with the cart, whether it's a plastic bag or uh, you know air conditioner or tire, and uh, we can type it in when we're there. So if the people call the office and say, why did you flunk my cart? We'll say, geez, you had an air conditioner in there, you know? So that's where we were at pre-pilot. Good, good, good note, Rob. I like it. Um, Arlene, anything to add to that mix uh, as the Mac? Uh, no, just that the uh, I was I became involved in this when the uh, Springfield Merck uh, started to send little nasty notes, as Spencer mentioned, back to uh, a couple of my towns, predominantly West Springfield. And they had a pretty significant contamination rate. Uh, but to Rob's credit, he was willing, uh, was very eager to participate in solutions. And so he came to the table early on um, and was looking for some assistance to uh, go along with the efforts he'd already put in place. Perfect. And um, far from least, uh, Gunther, how about you? What were you guys uh, doing pre pilot to tackle contamination? Yeah, one of the problems that we had is with uh, 5,000 stops every collection day and one enforcement coordinator, it, it was really tough to um, get them all. So it was hit or miss, but uh, through diligent efforts of Tina, who's in the picture there, we had our in-house door hangers and in-house slips, um, and we started mailing um, Violation letters, not not attached to fines, but violation letters for um, open carts and uh, other set out violations, but not so much on the on the contamination. So it's uh, great that the partnership uh, with DEP is uh, allowing us to move forward. All right, thanks, thanks, Gunther. And so, folks, I think we can all appreciate. You know, it's not these guys' first rodeo, and they're uh, uh, they're all diving into. They've already been engaging and. and uh, working to reduce contamination, but it's a big, it's a big, a big problem. So, um, you know, we're moving forward and uh, uh, and piloting some even more aggressive stuff. So, um, with that, let's jump on to the next thing. Um, let's just paint a quick picture of where we're piloting, uh, what specific areas of town we're we're working in, just so people can kind of kind of get the lay of the land. And um, so, to do that, why don't we start with uh, start with you, Rob? Okay, great. Uh, we uh, we wanted to take two uh, different types of areas. Um, basically, we we based it on popu population density. So we have uh, one area in town that's uh, very pop, you know, very densely populated, and uh, we picked another area that uh, is more open. It's it's got you know average uh, density for population that you'd find in a in a suburb. And with do in doing that. We also wanted two routes that had uh, about the same number of uh, units. Overall in town, we have about 8,860 units. Um, so that's the total. You'll double that for the number of carts we have that uh, Republic picks up uh, with the automated truck and puts in the karate can. So for this uh, pilot, we, you know, we picked two routes, about the same amount of units in two uh, very different uh, population densities. Okay, yes, that's perfect. Helped. And no, that that that's perfect. I've I've been out on both of them. They were well chosen and and fairly diverse. Um, uh, Patrick, anything to add as, as the guy who's driven uh, driven around that route and tremendously familiar with them? Well, the one the one key point was the one area that you actually see on the slide. We specifically chose that one because it has the highest contamination route contamination problem of any of the routes in, in West Springfield. No, super good, super good note. Um, so uh, a lot to fix, uh, which is which is smart. Um, so Gunther, how about how about you uh, in Lowell? What what routes uh, did you select? The primary impetus for picking a route, uh, and I believe the same in West Springfield, is you know where, where was it the worst? It, it didn't make sense for it to be in the neighborhood with the white picket fences and the one acre lots. Um, we backtracked and discovered where the failed load came from that waste management had uh, written us up for. And so we chose um, in our Friday collection day, the blue every other week, uh, and about 500 homes 
in multifamily, multi-language, multi-ethnic. Um, so it's a, it's a very diverse area with uh, additional challenges. And, and we figured if, if we could make a change there, then the uh, suburban areas with the white picket fences would be breeze. <laughs> All right, that sounds, that sounds outstanding. So let's, uh, let's dig a little bit deeper into what specifically is happening, and we'll just keep pe peeling back layers. Um, Cody, I'd like to toss this one to you. Um, could you just talk a little bit more specifically? We saw a general time frame. Can you dig a little deeper? Yeah, sure. So what what's kind of this kind of hits a great a, a great spot in the webinar. So what you've kind of heard is um, Jason laying out the communications plan and the idea behind hitting folks with communication. Um, and then the you know the two communities have have really hit on what they're doing. Um, as far as operations, and as Jason said, both need to work closely together. So for the for the timeline for this pilot, um, you know, right in the beginning, we kind of designed the layout of of the of the work and worked with the MRFs to understand what's acceptable, what's not, um, to create the material. And so uh, for the communications portion in, in these pilot areas, um, right before we started, um, like right in the beginning of the um, pilot that. When we started the pilots, we sent direct mail, put signage out, and really hit the hit the communities directly. Um, we are soon going to be sending out this second phase um, of work into the communities directly to the um, the residents on route. But while they're getting um, this information, this communication pieces in the mail or signage around their neighborhoods, we're actually tipping lids and rejecting carts. Republic Services and waste management are. Um, um, Kind of taking extra care when they're collecting and checking stuff out. So, and we'll get into those details. But, but while they're getting communication in the mail, they're also getting some feedback at their cart. Um, and then we're going to, at the end here, end of summer, um, do our um, analysis to do uh, to kind of check to see if there are improvements. Good stuff, Cody. All right. So that's just uh, another another layer in, and we're going to keep going um, for sure. So Murph said, uh, Cody, I'm going to throw this to you again. Uh, you get a twofer from me. Um, and so you know, the idea that uh, all the communities within a Murph uh, have something in common and, you know, within a, within a Murph said have something in common and, um, you know, looking at, looking at what that might mean for, for communities and how they run their programs and communicate with their residents. Can, can you tell me a few bars about that one? Yeah, as, as you kind of mentioned in the beginning, um, talking about the communications pieces, it's it's really important to be consistent, and so this is a part of the program, right? So um, we know where all the MRFs are in the um, in the Commonwealth, and we know the communities that go to those MRFs. So um, we're going to start. I think West Arlene in West Springfield has already really started doing this well, trying to come up with a consistent list, consistent images for all the communities that go to the same um, facility in uh, Western Massachusetts. Um, so the, the idea is that should be happening all over the Commonwealth, and so what, what we're doing is um, for these two pilot communities, their material ultimately ends up at the same MRF, uh, so, which was helpful. So um, understanding what's acceptable and what's not acceptable, um, and, then, and then we're able to understand and create from that information we're able to create the images and the language and terminology uh, moving forward. So the communities that are uh, that service uh, these specific MRFs are using same terminology, same language, same images, and whether we're uh, so these two pilots. I want to make sure I point this out. These two pilots are single stream, but this should work for uh, drop-offs. This should also work for dual stream programs, source separated programs, um, because it's really the same images um, and same same terminology should be used um, within these MRF sheds. Um, but just how they're collected are different. So, um, but we're really focusing in on this, and by the end of the end of the pilot, we hope to have some um, some good images and terminology that um, communities can use depending on the MRF they uh, send their material to. All right, good uh, good stuff. And I will say that um, uh, one uh, uh, one attendee has just asked a, a question or two that is going to come up in a minute. That I'm pretty I'm pretty excited that she's sort of preloading it. Uh, she's so just just for just for a preview, she's asked: Is anyone uh, looking at specific contaminants found in bins and targeting outreach and education towards those? So I just want to give that out as almost like a little movie preview because we're going to hit that in a minute, and it's going to be great. Uh, but thanks, thanks, Cody. One one more question on um, 
on this Murph said piece, if, if people are going to be creating these um, these kind of more more streamlined uh, descriptions of what they accept and what they don't, you know, obviously the waste stream changes um, and what's recyclable changes. How often should they be in contact with their MRF about these these lists to be sure they're on point? Oh, geez, I would as often as possible. Um, at a minimum, a couple times a year. Uh, talk to your MRF um, and and we have a worksheet that you can use as a framework to ha for the conversation. But just like you said, the the waste stream is changing constantly. So. You, MRFs, is cha MRFs are changing, equipment's changing, um, markets change, just you always want to have these conversations. People are still using terminology that was being, edu you know, that was we were sending out in the 80s about curbside recycling and um, and really there could be refreshes every year. Okay, thanks, thanks for that and let's, uh, let's move on with our show here. Um, next up, I talked about 321 uh, all too briefly. Um, for me, because I really love talking about three, two, one. Um, and as a reminder, the three were sort of very targeted pieces, uh, like rejection notices, uh, curbside communications, triggers at points of recycling, and material-specific information. Two was general advertising, and one was the website. Um, I'd love to throw the ball over back to our communities to talk about really the main the main variable there is the number two, the general advertising pieces that they decided were smart for reaching their residents. Um, so let me let me throw it to Rob first. Rob, what what general approaches did you guys select um, for that general advertising? Uh, so for general advertising, uh, if you go to the town of West Springfield website right now, you can't uh, get into the website until you X out of the screen that uh, shows you the things that you should be recycling and should not be recycling. So website was an obvious presence that uh, that we we chose, and with a lot of help with material from the recycling partnership. It was great. Uh, another thing we did is we uh, we've got some four foot by eight foot signs from a, a local sign a supplier, and uh, it's got the shine on uh, recycle logo uh, picture on it, and we've just deployed those uh, two each in our. Uh, our pilot areas that we're studying right now. So we deployed those. Uh, one of them's on an old uh, recycle, an old recycling truck that we use. Uh, we repurposed uh, for something else. So that's uh, that's made a good impact in town. Uh, we're also uh, we have uh, like a lot of towns we have the robocall we call it the ability to call each house and uh, get a quick uh, you know message to them 20 or 30 second message. So we've developed some messages um, about the program and what we're trying to uh, focus on. Uh, to, we're going to, you know, sending those to those houses on the pilot areas. Um, and those are uh, those are some of our some of our basic general advertising things that we've done up to this time. Outstanding. Th thanks, Rob. And of course, in addition to that, uh, mailing the info card and magnet. Um, Putting, putting curbside communications in the form of oops tags and thank you tags and, and that sort of thing. Um, they're doing as well. Uh, Gunther, how about you? What do you go for for general advertising? Yeah, in the in previous slide, you had mentioned about how we need to change and update and grow and, and improve. And uh, one of the things you'll notice on, on this is that we'd no longer say, you know, refer to the triangle. If it has a triangle, it goes in the bin. Um, so it's very specific, and we thank, uh, again, the Mass DEP for the grant and the Recycling Partnership for providing the Level 2 material. Um, in the past, we have uh, A-frames that you'd see around town. I think we have uh, 13 of them that are used for elections, used for hazardous waste day, used for end-of-yard waste, and um, they have slide-in channels, so the partnership made it possible for us to have uh, a-frames, we put five double-sided A-frames throughout the um, pilot area, and the same material was printed by a, a local printer and brought to market basket. Uh, and we talked about partnerships before. You never know who a partner is in, until you ask, and, and uh, market basket stepped up to the plate, and we have uh, the market basket that is most immediate to our pilot area that was more than gracious to give us window space and uh, space in the aisles for the A-frames. 
and then uh, we'll follow that up with a second phase uh, mailer on plastic bags. Fabulous. I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, both, uh, both West Springfield and Lowell uh, decided for their material specific uh, piece under the number three there uh, to target plastic bags um, in a variety of ways, but to reach out to people specifically and say, hey, plastic bags and things in plastic bags are a problem. Um, and I guess uh, I'd love to do a quick round robin as to why why that was chosen. And maybe we'll start with start with Cody, and then uh, and then to see if the other fellows have anything they want to throw in on it. Uh, Cody, why plastic bags? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I mentioned that um, kind of like that the Murph shed piece before, and a and a big part of that is not under not only understanding what's acceptable in the Murph, but what's not acceptable, and. We as recyclers, I'm very guilty of this. I want to tell all of my residents uh, just about um, everything that's not recyclable. So I create like this uh, 700 item list of things. Um, and, and really what we're trying to do with this pilot is we ask the MRFs to focus in on what are your top five, right? What, do you, what are the things that are uh, degrading uh, material quality, creating uh, um, kind of safety hazards, uh, shutting down equipment, uh, increase in processing costs, et cetera, et cetera. So we asked them to just rank them for us. And and so plastic bags um, came to the top of the list as the biggest issue, and so that's what we focused on here. But along with that were, were tanglers, like uh, extension cords, um, material recyclables and refuse that are in bags, um, and uh, scrap metal, and what was another one, Jason? I think there was one other. Oh, textiles, geez. well, uh, tanglers, scrap, yeah, scrap metal, yeah, absolutely. We bag. have plastic bags, there. stuff in plastic bags, gross, sticky, yucky, gloopy things, um, yeah. like food. I think I think of things like yogurt, but yeah, food, the textiles, the tanglers, and then also just bulky stuff. Yep. yep. So we're focusing okay. only on those and in the, in the project. Right, and plastic bags rose to the top. It was the biggest material that was a problem, causes Murph's a lot of problems. So both communities gravitated to it immediately. Just to check, anything anything else from uh, from any of the other speakers on on the choice of plastic bags before we uh, jump on? Yeah, this is Gunther. If I can add uh, one thing, even when we were manual dual stream, our bins were specifically the the curbside tubs were specifically labor labeled for um, popular non-inclusive items, which was uh, pizza boxes, styrofoam, and plastic bags. The bins were labeled no plastic bags, and then when we switched to automated single stream, the message was still no plastic bags. Um, but recently, after the pilot began and uh, more stricter enforcement, we got uh, a very nasty uh, voicemail, anonymous voicemail. Um, boy, your system is so complicated, and now you don't even accept plastic bags? So it is, it's a battle that we're going to fight, and uh, as much as the MRFs don't want it, uh, we will continue, and we appreciate the Recycling Partnership's uh, second wave of literature so that uh, residents know that uh, we don't want stuff in bags or loose bags. Good man. Okay. Thanks, thanks uh, Gunther, for that clarification, our additional piece. Uh, let's uh, stay on track and move on. Next up, uh, training. So obviously, if we're going to be rolling this stuff out, and particularly the stuff we're doing at the curb, uh, leaving notifications for people, uh, we got, we've got to train up uh, some people on the street to be able to do this well and consistently. Um, so Gunther, why don't you hold on to the mic and, and tell, us, uh, tell us how you handled uh, training to ensure sort of appropriate uh, messaging and consistency. Yeah, the, the important thing here is that um, we all use the same language. You know, we talk about uh, the MRF shed and, and everything that goes to the waste management material recovery facility in, in Berica. Um, and, and with that, we've uh, spoken to the lead driver who shares that with his uh, Monday morning tailgate sessions. And in the picture you see here during our waste audit, we had uh, all the team look into the same bin and describe, uh, you know, what, what do you see? And, and so we're all on the same sheet of music. And so now it's between the enforcement officer, which was hired through the grant, and the city's uh, Recycling Enforcement Coordinator, the Hauler, and the, and the MRF. It's a, it's a great partnership. 
Okay, perfect. Um, and uh, Patrick, uh, since you trained, um, you know, you you trained the other side of the coin, uh, training training your driver to uh, uh, to participate in this. How how did you approach that? Well, our drivers all, you know, when they take on a recycling route, whether it's the dual stream or the single stream, you know, we go through extensively the lists of what they can and can't take, what's supposed to be in there. Um, we provide them with the literature um, that we get right from the MRF. Um, you know, we try and stay updated on the MRF's website and anytime they start accepting new materials so that we can tell the drivers, hey, you know, they just started taking pizza boxes and clamshells um, and aerosol cans, which were formerly not acceptable. You know, they started accepting them a couple of years ago. So, you know, it's a, it's a partnership. As, as we keep talking about, if we don't have a partnership between the hall of the town and the MRF, this program is very difficult to manage and make work. That's, I don't think anybody could say it better. Uh, everybody has to, what, what is it that we like to say? Um, recycling is a highly dependent, loosely connected network of, uh, network of players. And um, really, if any of them lose, then everybody does. So, uh, you know, Patrick, you nailed it. Um, it's important that coordination is super important. So let's uh, let's jump on to um, what they're doing at the curb. We hear how they trained on it, but uh, um, what are the, what are the SOPs out there? And so, Cody, could you just give us a quick introduction to, um, to to sort of what the procedures are out of the curb? Yeah, I I actually wish we had more time. I would prefer to talk about uh, the side project we got going on, um, researching donut shops in both pilot communities. Um, you can see Arlene there uh, providing some really tasty treats before the pilot, and I think that's crucial to any successful program before you started getting some good donuts, but um, that's for, I guess, another webinar. Um, I can get into the, uh, to the details of what we did at the curb, and so both, both communities are, are fairly similar, and so both are using enforcement officers uh, going out before the trucks start their route. Uh, they're tipping every lid. In, um, on the routes, they're, when they tip the lid, they're, they're looking for the six things that we kind of mentioned before um, that they might see in there that are contaminants. They're not digging around in the carts, just what's on top. If there's contamination, say there's a bag of recyclables on the top, they're leaving a rejection notice um, and they're moving on to the next cart and trying to, and they're getting through these routes, um, tipping every lid in about two hours. Um, and then the trucks can come in behind. And when the trucks come in behind, they have what we're calling reminder uh, tags in their vehicles. And so when the, um, when the enforcement officers miss something, uh, which they will because stuff is on the bottom, if they notice something fall out of the cart that was on the bottom, uh, the truck driver is getting out and tagging with the reminder tag that says, next time um, we won't collect this if it's not uh, corrected. And so, um, all the addresses that are rejected are um, um, we're, we're marking them down, and then the two weeks later, when we come back to these um, uh, to these routes to these pilot areas, we we have our spreadsheet in front of us of all the things that all their addresses that got tagged previously, either by the truck driver or by the enforcement officer, and um, we're checking them again. But we're first we're going to tip every lid just like we did before, but it's paying special attention to those that got rejected the previous collection. If those carts that got tagged before um, fixed the problem, they get a thank you note on the cart, reinforcing, yes, you did it right this time, we, really, we noticed and we appreciate. Um, and if it wasn't correct, uh, they just leave another tag and the, that resident is not collected at that time. Um, and so, so really what they have, uh, enforcement officers are rejecting, truck drivers are giving reminders if they see problems, and then we're tracking, um, tracking those tags over the course of the, of the pilot to uh, try to understand um, what's working, what's not, and, and hopefully reducing contamination. Good, good overview. Um, and I'd love to throw it to West Springfield, Rob and Patrick. Um, uh, any any particular nuance you wanna you wanna highlight from those SOPs for uh, for your town? Uh, yeah, this is Rob. Uh, I'll give it a shot. The um, so before the pilot, we had a, a tag that uh, Republic Services developed, and we would put it on the cart if we found contamination, and that would tell Republic's driver to not pick the cart up. 
And we, uh, with eight with eight thousand carts, so it's nine hundred carts a day. We were having a hard time staying in front of the truck with just the one person. This uh, this time around with the pilot, uh, we've got two crews of uh, two crews of two people, and we're we're looking at every cart, every cart that's out there. We're we're looking at it. We uh, our our crews that are looking at the carts. Uh, we're we have uh, two tags with us, and we did two different methods for the program. The area that was more contaminated uh, showed more contamination by history. We gave everybody a thank you note the very first week if their cart was good. We gave them a thank you note. And then uh, anybody that we gave a red tag to that first week, uh, the following week uh, we checked it a little harder to see if, uh, you know, if it was good. Just maybe we shook the cart a little bit to see if there's anything hidden in the bottom. And then if it, if it was good to go, we gave them a thank you tag. So we always try to follow up a, 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 a not a not so positive a tag with a positive tag, as it was brought up earlier in the uh, webinar today. Um, and that seems to be working out. The uh, the tags the Republic's driver has those are to put on the carts uh, in the event, like Patrick said, uh, that they see something in the bottom of the cart that the uh, the, the top, the uh, cart tippers, you know, the, the top tippers did not see. Yep, perfect. That's exactly right. Patrick, anything quick to add on that? Well, no, just uh, just to, to reinforce the fact that once a, a resident does, in fact, get a tag, um, in order to, to be successful with that resident, that's when they really need to, you know, stick it, take a deeper look into it. Um, you know, and that, that's a key component of, of reducing this contamination. Outstanding. And uh, Gunther, throwing it your way. Um, anything specific uh, on these curbside SOPs that you'd like to highlight for Lowell? Yeah, we, we already mentioned uh, parallel similar training so that uh, both the um, enforcement coordinator and the um, inspector that we hired through the grant are looking for the same objects when they uh, split on their routes. Um, in particular, the Cambodian Mutual Assistance Association here in Lowell was uh, super helpful in translating. Um, the particular pilot area has a high concentration of uh, immigrants, be they Latino or Cambodian, so it was important for us that uh, our outreach literature was uh, simple and the Recycling Partnership did an excellent job of uh, picking icons that uh, are eye-catching and very simple to read, but then our local partners uh, customized it for the foreign languages where my French and German didn't help us. <laughs> well said. Uh, um, and last step on this one, and I, I know we've been on the slide for a little while, but it, it's super, it's a super critical piece of the, of the pilot. It, it may be the heart of the whole thing. Um, Arlene, anything to, anything to add? You were out on the route um, and, and in every meeting leading up to it, planning for it. I'd sure be, I'd be happy to comment um, as, you're, as, as everybody else has been sharing. It was my privilege to be able to walk with uh, Cody as a teammate on the first day that we lifted lids in West Springfield. Uh, you know, I thought I died and gone to heaven, gotten to look in everybody's uh, recycling container, so that was kind of fun. <laughs> it is amazing what people think is recyclable and put in the container. So a couple of thoughts. Um, while this pilot is focusing on automated single stream uh, containers. My experience in seeing what I saw on the street um, would suggest that this idea of the type of contamination we're seeing is not just um, owned by those who do single stream in automated cars. Uh, I work with a lot of curbside communities that are dual stream and the same kind of material would be seen there. So I'm excited about this project not just for what we're seeing in these pilot communities, but how it's transferable to the other communities that all of us uh, in my job represent. And the information and what we see and the messaging is going to be invaluable to us throughout the Commonwealth. And that being said, again, the partnership here is, is also transferable. The hauler working with the community and all of us working with the MRF, the single messaging uh, throughout the, the shed, the MRF shed, is all critical to all of our programs, not just to these 
four communities that have been lucky to be chosen as the pilot. So that would be my only uh, comment, Jason. I think that's a, a solid comment. And just in case anybody's out there listening and saying, boy, but I've got drop-off for a for drop-off program, or a drop-off program is a large part of my overall scheme. Um, we're also, we'll be talking about that in the next one, uh, because we're, we're, we're working with the town of Needham around drop-off as well. But yeah, these, these pilots are very much single stream curbside to date, but we're, we're digging, we're digging deeper soon. Uh, but great, great comments all. Uh, let's jump on to the next piece. Um, our learnings. So, uh, really, in brief, what what data are we collecting, tracking, and measuring success by? Uh, and Cody, could you kind of briefly touch on that? Mr. Marshall. So, so you can't hear me when I'm on mute, apparently. Um, well, we're so, good now. Though. Okay. Are you still on mute? <laughs> I'm not. Um, okay. So, yeah. So an important piece of um, of this project is measuring the results. Um, you know, instead of going on gut feelings like oh, we think we're you know we're we're making change and, and people are doing better, we're really going to track it. Um, the the teams that are out there, uh, Republic Services Waste Management, um, the town enforcement officers have just been great at tracking the data, and it's and it's crucial for us to understand what was what was helpful, what wasn't, and what does this really look like? And so the things that we're tracking, um, one thing that we haven't touched on yet is we're doing a recovery rate study before and after that is looking at contamination that's in recycling and looking at, garb uh, looking at the recycling that's in the garbage. So we're tracking that before, implementing this, the stuff that we're doing, and then we're, and then we're doing the study again to see what the difference is. So we're looking at that. We're going to look at the percent change of the specific materials on the route. Hopefully they kind of increase and contamination decreases. Um, and we're um, and then we're also looking at the, the impact of set out rates. Um, hopefully they stay consistent or increase. Um, and then the, the impact of recovery rates um, over the period of time because they are getting these communication pieces and getting a, a few touches about recycling. Hopefully recovery rates for the material improves. Um, the material that the enforcement officers are tracking at the curb is very specific to the tag. And so what we're doing is we're going to track the change in the tag use over the course of the pilot. So hopefully um, we put a lot of tags out in the beginning, people start to get the message, and so you don't have to leave as many tags out towards the end. That's the idea anyway. So the effectiveness of the tags is what we're going to look at. And we're also going to look at the, the effectiveness of the, the positive reinforcement um, aspect of this. Perfect. Love it. Thank you very much. Um, let's, uh, let's keep on jumping because I'm looking at the clock and seeing we've got, we've got seven action-packed minutes. Um, so findings to date, and I'd like to do a quick round robin with, uh, with, with the local, uh, local program folks on, generally speaking, sort of, you know, what have you seen so far? Kind of, kind of a qualitative assessment of we've launched, we're several weeks in. Uh, what, what have you seen? So, um, Gunther, uh, to date, what, what, what have you found? Yeah, the, the nice thing about a, a curbside collection in a pilot is, uh, as mentioned, we are actually looking under every lid. And uh, that one-on-one -on -one interaction, uh, both Tina and Bora speak Khmer, and they've been helpful in translating. <clears throat> Folks will come up to them and say, what are you doing? What, what am I doing wrong? And um, the finding so far is, is that with that personal touch and um, when a truck comes, automated truck comes, it's disconnected, it's sterile, folks really don't know that you're watching, but now that we actually touch each cart um, with a great team, it makes a, a big difference and we see that uh, in, their, in the residents' uh, reaction and, and willingness to call us for assistance. All right, well, well played, Gunther, and how about, uh, how about you, Patrick? <laughs> Well, from, from a driver's perspective, I just get to report from my driver. His findings to date are simple. He's seen a reduction in the amount of tags, of red tags, that he was allowed to drive by the first week. Um, so as long as that number keeps coming down, initial impression is it appears to be working so far. Beautiful. And uh, Rob, anything to add to that? I'd just like to add that uh, what was said a few times, uh, the feeling of the teamwork is pretty amazing. Prior to the pilot, uh, it, you feel, uh, it's easy to feel a little bit lonely when you're getting the notices about recycling contamination. 
and uh, you know you're trying to you're trying to get a handle on this. But the point we're at right now, this is a great process. I, I hope uh, it's a, it gets available to more you know more communities around the state and, and the country. I really uh, I really think it's a great program and it's going to have great impact on the uh, contamination recycling uh, and uh, improve the quality of the product. Love it. Perfect. Um, thanks, folks. And uh, next up, now that again you're 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 well into it, you're several weeks in. Um, just let's just for fun in one sentence each. Um, you know, what's your impression? What's your impression of the overall program? Is it gonna is it good? Is it bad? You know, happy or sad? Could be better. Whatever. Uh, one sentence impression. You can just use a word if you'd rather. Uh, but starting with you, Arlene. Great. <laughs> oh, the donuts, tell, just put it on for me. The donuts were great, but that's, that's not the sentence. Uh, I think it's great. The partnership is working very well. We're learning as we go and making adjustments, and I think that's critical. Beautiful. Um, Rob? Yeah, I, I said it again, but I don't want to repeat it, but the partnership, the feeling of the partnership is, is great, and it's really effective, and it has really... Uh, given a lot of uh, purpose and a lot of um, a, a lot of push to the whole effort you know everybody it's like everybody's really behind it together now more so than I think in the past perfect um, Gunther yeah since this is probably the last time that I'll have the, the microphone um, I'll take advantage and my sentence would be um, a picture is worth a thousand words you know if you see the before picture the after picture you know what uh, great strides we've made and uh, the material that the partnership puts out is uh, clean and crisp and professional so that's a, another part of the the overall picture that's making a change here all right and uh, Patrick bring bring us home on this well I think we've had a common theme throughout this and without a partnership between the haulers and the cities and the MERS you know this kind of a program wouldn't work as well as it could. Um, one thing that we, I would love to see added is, you know, uh, a way to bring the MERS closer to the haulers, no matter what company they are, but towards that one common goal of improving recycling so that we can all always stay on the same page and on the same track. Okay. I think that's, uh, I think that's a good, a good looking forward thought. Um, with uh, about 90 seconds left, Cody wants to take 45 to 60 of them and just talk about what folks can expect uh, in the coming weeks and months. Absolutely. We're going to, we're in the middle of completing the pilots right now, kicking off the drop off and the education only pilots this month. We're going to continue to measure. We're going to report out on that measuring and then create resources that um, MassDEP uh, can provide to communities around the Commonwealth. Beautiful. Okay. And boy, we are down to the last minute. Uh, super quick thank you to the Recycling Partnerships uh, funding partners overall. They allow us to do our work. Um, I'd be super excited to thank uh, Matt CEP and all of our pilot communities as well. Uh, I really have to thank the Max because they're all absolutely phenomenal. I just don't, I, I wish I had some around me because they're just they're the best resources ever. Um, and uh, I guess that's our closing slide, so I'll thank everybody, and particularly our, our panel of speakers for sharing great information, and all of our attendees for your interest and, and the questions you've shared throughout. Um, it looks like we're about 20 seconds to three. I love ending early, so uh, let's call it the webinar from us in the early fall with all the results from all the pilots and tools and resources to boot. And in the meantime, please sign up for our uh, e-newsletter. Let us know what we can do to help you. And, and Stay in touch, and thanks, everybody. Thanks, sir.